All right, so we ended up last time on page 229 uh, at the upper right, which is in the beginning of PDF notes number eight on 3D Kirchhoff migration. What we're doing now is we are exploring um, how migration is done now with pre-stack migration. And first we are exploring pre-stack time migration as done by uh, Kirchhoff ellipsoidal summation. And then we're going to take a look at pre-stack depth migration uh, using the same process. And all of that wants me, brings me to uh, a warning that you might, uh, you might see a, a processing output say that they're going to deliver you 3D uh, or, or any kind of uh, pre-stack depth migration. But unless they do all the hard work to constrain the lateral changes in velocity, it's not, um, what you're really getting is PSTM and not the PSDM that you ordered. It's going to be the same, uh, the same algorithm, the same programs, all the same parameter settings on the migration. But if you're lacking that excellent knowledge of lateral velocity variation, you only have PSTM. And they cannot claim to be giving you more. Uh, yet they do. So um, a word for the wise. OK. So in three dimensions, we have uh, this little stacking chart here, uh, which is not, uh, uh, not really, uh, it's our data volume. <clears throat> and our, of course, our, our sources are located by a location vector, S, which I can represent on the stacking chart just with its magnitude. In other words, the distance from the origin of the, of the coordinates. And the same with the receivers. They could be anywhere. Um, they can be, the sources can be earthquakes at 20 kilometers depth. The receivers can be in a well. They can be uh, on a cable pulled by a ship. They can be geophones planted in the ground. So um, this formulation allows all of these, all of these uh, elements of the survey to be located anywhere in three dimensions. In any case, we find some way to organize the, uh, the data volume. And uh, since I can only draw 3D, I can't very easily draw a four-dimensional picture for you. Um, I'm going to stick with a 2D stacking chart on the top of this cube here. And what's now on this um, um, what's now on this on this uh, front face of the of the cube here is a uh, stacking chart. I'm sorry. What's on the front face is a shot gather, and that shot and and the you know every slice parallel to that going back in is another shot gather. So the the shot gather might be uh, very well organized. It, it could be in order of, uh, of offset. It could all be from one azimuth. It could be uh, from, it could all be one offset sort in order of azimuth. It could have everything all mixed together in no particular order, no particular organization. It's going to be, uh, you know, however you collect it in the field. And uh, let's see. No, I'm sorry. The front face is a common receiver gather on this one. The left face would be the shot gather, just the way that I've, I've laid this out. All right. So you take one trace, which is at some combination of source and receiver coordinates. And you can see that both of those are vectors in 3D space. And you, um, you look down a time t, and you see an impulse. All right. So the full double square root equation and migration, easy to express for constant velocity, give us an ellipsoid of revolution about the vector that connects s to g. All right. So the ellipse, for instance, that you see on the surface 
Okay, now these are the real x easting and y northing coordinates, for instance, and depth pointing down, pointing down on the screen. Okay, this, this ellipse has s and g as its foci. And then if you take the, uh, the vertical section and you see the half ellipse um, that is uh, uh, in the vertical uh, plane that uh, connects s and g, all right. Then, um, then you also see an ellipse, and that uh, that half ellipse also has S and G locations as its foci. Okay, the size of the ellipse, the uh, you know the radius or average radius, if you like, of the ellipse, is going to be controlled by the time, very naturally. Okay. So notice here that this ellipsoid contains, at least for that particular time, right? this ellipse is at a particular reflection time t, that ellipse contains all, all possible dips as well as all possible dip orientations. So up here in the, near the surface, uh, in, in constant velocity, it's very simple. right? Near the surface, that's where you have the 90 degree dips. The flat dips are, are down at the, at the bottom of the ellipsoid, uh, kind of a, or, or imagine a half football if you want. Actually, it's more of a rugby ball, not as pointy as a football. And the, um, uh, the intermediate dips are at intermediate depths. Okay. So this, this, should tell you everything you need to know about uh, some of the things that you already know about how you acquire data to get uh, structures in different orientations of different dip. So for instance, if you are looking for a, a flat structure, well then it's clear you can put S and G at any offset um, and, uh, and you can put it uh, right above, you can put your source, at your midpoint, you know, which is in between S and G. You can put your midpoint right above the flat spot you're trying to image. If, on the other hand, you're trying to get a dip, for instance, a steep dip back towards the uh, the origin here, okay, just in this in this little uh, uh, example, all right. So then uh, that means you have to be on this right edge of the ellipse ellipsoid. And up near the surface, and so if you were uh, if you were trying to get uh, a near ninety degree dip at a great depth, well then you need a really huge ellipse, which means you're going to need um, you need to you're going to need to stand off at a very large travel time and have a very large uh, as I'm calling it ellipsoidal radius. Okay, so S and G are going to be need to, to get that dip at least in um, in a constant velocity area, to get that dip uh, and that orientation, you're going to have to shoot down dip of the of the uh, of the dipping reflector by quite a long way. So you can look at this ellipsoid and, and even plan your uh, your survey once you know what your targets are. So this shows you how to record reflections from all dips in any, or any orientation. And you can make this for um, in in our um, uh, you know what what your velocity model really is, whether it's a vertically varying velocity model or even a laterally varying velocity model in three dimensions. You can you can cast these these ellipsoids, and you can uh, you can plan your survey. All right, so I'm going to reference one of my early papers. And this is um, this is published uh, ages ago, and what we know now is that if we can migrate, and we learned this back in seven oh six, if we can migrate any point in the data, then since any uh, data arrival and any structure is a superposition of many points, you know by Huygens' principle, then we can make a migration routine out of a superposition. Of impulse responses. Okay, just to remind you, impulse in the in the data set, 
impulse response in the 3D world. So, uh, uh, and, and I wrote this way too fast. I should probably just totally rewrite it. Um, for each time point on each trace, all we have to do is form that ellipsoid in our XYZ section. The amplitude of that ellipsoid is going to be proportional to the amplitude of the trace at that time point. So where there are strong arrivals, you form clear ellipsoids. Where there are no arrivals, you don't add any ellipsoids or you have very weak ellipsoids being added to the model space. Now, the, how this is actually done, I laid out in this paper in this ancient uh, diagram, um, which I should you know, redraw using uh, Adobe Illustrator or something. So this is the, the Kirchhoff sum algorithm, and it's, it's an output-based mapping. And basically, this solves at once both parts of this pre-stack migration. Okay? What are the two components that you need for migration? Okay, you need a downward continuation, and you need an imaging condition. Okay? And this is the, the very simplest possible part of accomplishing a very simplest possible method to accomplish both of those procedures. All right? Mm -hmm. So let me explain. Output based migration. So we start by looping over individual elements in the migrated section, our output section. Okay? So we're actually going to start with our output. We're going to fill it with zeros. Okay? When we start our procedure. And we um, uh, we're going to pick a uh, we're going to pick a trace, okay? So we have a, a, our data volume, and here you can see kind of a, a shock gather that looks uh, uh, weirdly like uh, one of the shock gathers that's considered in this paper. And uh, we're going to pick a trace somewhere in that data volume, okay? And um, so it's going to be this trace here. So since we've picked out a trace, and actually what we do is we, uh, I, I read the trace into the, um, into the program, you know, one trace at a time. And so that trace has a known source location. It has a known receiver location. All right. And then for every trace, I have uh, uh, an internal loop. Okay, so the outer lo outermost loop is a loop over all the traces in the data volume. Then there's uh, uh, two loops inside that, and for every every trace in the migrated section, you know the traces hang down in Z. Okay, every trace in the migrated section, I loop through all the different depth levels in that trace. So I know the source location, I know the receiver location, and down deep in that in that inside all of those three loops, I know the the X and Z location. Of the um, of the reflection point, okay, and you can't quite see it, but this x here is a vector. It's in bold, so I should probably mark it with a with a vector symbol, okay. So that x, uh, you know, the z is a, is a scalar, of course, but the x can be anywhere in in the x vector has x and y components, okay. So now we can get the all we have to do is get the travel time, all right, and this is um, uh, this is the um, uh, we have some travel time relation, right? That's our imaging condition, okay? We know the, where the source is, we know where the receiver is, we know exactly where the reflector is. All we need is is to project the travel time from the source location to the um, to the reflecting point. And constant velocity, what do you do? It's just a, it's just a Pythagorean uh, solution, Pythagorean theorem. And then uh, likewise, from the reflection point back up to the, to the receiver. Okay, I'll talk a little bit more about how to do that. All right. 
So uh, the imaging condition could be as simple for constant velocity as uh, the Pythagorean theorem. And that's all that this time function is. So we get a, a value for the time given that source, that receiver, that, that reflector location on the map, and its depth. And that gives us a time. Then we're working with this one trace. We go down in that trace, and we find the amplitude uh, of the trace at that imaging condition time. And then we just sum it in. You know, We start with, with a migrated section that's all zero. And whatever's there before, we sum this new amplitude in. Okay, that's the downward continuation. Okay, I'm getting the travel time, you know, down to this depth. So I'm taking the surface recording and I'm adding its amplitude. And as as you can imagine, you know, it makes kinematic sense. It makes sense, you know, given that you know what the travel time is. But does it make dynamic sense? You know, does it make sense in terms of the amplitudes of waves? No. It's not following any. Uh, it's not following any particular um, um, any particular theory. Okay. Uh, we'll talk later about about what this this kind of downward continuation really gets you. And what it gets you is a view of the relative impedance contrast. Okay. And we have to uh, we have to take a whole bunch of. Uh, asymptotic approximations to the wave equation to get there. Uh, and, and, you know, this, uh, uh, so, so there, is, there is some dynamics behind it, but with what we're doing here, you know, you can see there's no, there's no uh, consideration here of, there's, there's no consideration of, of, say, geometric spreading, amplitude loss as you, as the size of the wavefront uh, Increases. We're not correcting for that. Um, you know, even those most basic physical processes that that you already know about, the 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 downward continuation is ignoring all of those. Yeah. I was going to say it does, assuming you don't do any pre-processing like spherical divergence or any kind of gaining, right? Because if you gain it up, all of a sudden there's going to be way higher amplitudes in the deeper part. That that's right. That's right. We 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 do all of that because all we, you know, when 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 I started doing this kind of uh, PSTM, really what I cared about was the, I cared that, that the reflectors were stronger than the incoherent structure around them. In this case, the San Andreas Fault, in the edges of the fault zone, you know, structure that I can interpret would be more reflective than just the, the average random variations in velocity that, that surround the San Andreas Fault. Okay, so there's there was a relative amplitude concern, uh, but I didn't really care, um, you know, exactly what the uh, the reflection coefficients were. I just wanted to properly locate the reflectors. That's and that's all this does. Okay, uh, if you have the right velocity, this will give you and the no, I'm sorry. If you can calculate the travel time correctly, then this will give you the um, the correct uh, uh, this will give you the correct geometric image, and and back in the era of structural uh, um, and the beginnings of stratigraphic oil exploration, that was enough. Okay. So is the idea if you have any noise and it gets gained up, and there's an impulse response for that noise, right? It'll all just kind of cancel out. That's right. That's right. Okay. But always, you know, at the edge of the section. You're going to see, or at the edge of your of your survey, certainly, you're going to see lots of of these um, ellipsoids of revolution, and that's how you know that they're uh, they're. Uh, that's how you know that that they're migration artifacts, you know, because they're they're impulse responses of the truncation of the data against the edge of the survey, or the limits of the survey. Okay, so that's the uh, uh, you know that's the imaging condition down here, evaluating the travel time, summing in the amplitude of the trace into the migrated section. That's the uh, of the downward continuation. Okay, very very crude, very very simple. All right.
so, so, you know, we want to get that travel time, and, and immediately I'm going to go off into a discussion of velocity. But we have new methods of getting travel time. So this method doesn't, doesn't require, actually, thinking about it, it doesn't require knowledge of velocity. It only requires knowledge of travel time. All right? Now, what if there was some other way of getting the travel time to a, um, uh, you know, from a point on the surface uh, where our survey is to a point at depth? And it turns out now there is, okay? With um, empirical Green's functions, all right, we can correlate uh, seismic noise and we can get those travel times from any point that we can record noise from. So uh, if you have a uh, 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 if you have a set of an array of stations, then um, uh, using seismic noise, you can um, um, you can get seismograms as if you had set off an explosion at each one of those stations. Okay. Uh, uh, that's the way EGFs are, are, are interpreted, okay? But they really do, EGFs, you know, they come from real data on the real wave field. So if there are velocity variations, they're reflected in the EGFs. The EGFs themselves, you know, it's a very simple data product. It doesn't rely on, on any assumption about the velocity. So we may, uh, and, and, uh, colleagues of mine like uh, Luca Kelly at um, uh, at Texas A and M and uh, Jerry Schuster when he was at uh, uh, University of Utah, um, they looked at at adapting the EGF techniques for exploration, and they came up with um, ideas uh, called uh, uh, image sources and. Um, uh, basically, you can downward continue your survey now by doing cross correlation between uh, uh, between different receivers, and you can do downward continuation uh, without assuming anything about the velocity. Okay, maybe without analyzing the velocity. Okay, you can do that to down. You can you can do um, downward continuation and. You know, lower your survey below the velocity confusions of the near surface layer. You can lower your survey um, down uh, uh, below a structural interpretation. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting things that are that are possible here, and that's a that's a topic that uh, I could lecture on later if we have time and you guys want it. Is uh, the use of image sources and uh, empirical Green's functions. In, in exploration, I would go through uh, some of Vichelle and uh, and Schuster's key papers. Uh, so there might be uh, uh, because the 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 wave fields used by empirical Green's function analysis are real and are and and reflect. That's a bad word to use in this context. Uh, you know, are are affected by the velocity. Okay, because the you can see the velocity in, in empirical Green's functions, that means that, that you can use empirical Green's functions to get times and not necessarily have to analyze the velocity. So I, I think that could, uh, that could bring some uh, new capabilities to, uh, um, to this old, uh, old migration method. Okay. So, all right, suppose you know the velocities and you know that, that you know, in these sections, the velocity varies in 3D, okay? Well, how do you have to change the algorithm? Hardly at all. It only affects the calculation of the travel time. So long as you can calculate the travel time, you can do this, this uh, Kirchhoff migration, uh, pre-stack migration, regardless of geometry, and now 
so long as you can calculate the, the travel times regardless of velocity. Okay, so a lot of the simplifications that we've made before, we can just blow away. All right. Now we're we're limited, especially at the time that uh, I put these notes together. We're extremely limited in the in how easily we could get travel times from surface points to each depth point. Okay. Um, so suppose that velocity depends only on z, and we know in most places velocity certainly depends strongly on depth. Okay. So it's a situation we want to handle very well. Uh, but maybe we haven't done all the work necessary yet to, um, to constrain the, la the lateral velocity variations. And what we want to do is a pre-stack time migration. Okay? So that's what this paper sets up. Um, and let me, uh, let me discuss how that's done now. All right. So what we need then is the travel time from every surface point to every, uh, every depth point. Now let me go back up to my little 3D world diagram here. Okay, on the right here, you know, we've got easting x and northing y and depth z, and we have sources and receivers and, and you know, every point along the ellipsoid of revolution here, you know, is, is one of our candidate uh, um, reflection points. So we want to be able to cast a, uh, a travel time from any surface location where we might have an S or a G, right? And it doesn't matter which one, right? Because by reciprocity, you know, having a source point is as good as having a receiver point. Okay? All we need is that travel time. So uh, reciprocity is easy to assume. Again, we're not, you know, too concerned about amplitude here. So, um, uh, now what you what you realize is that whatever point in the subsurface you're looking at as a reflector, you know wherever it is in this volume, and um, you know let's say it's directly under G, okay, and we're trying to get the travel time from from the source point to that reflecting point, okay. If velocity only varies in depth and doesn't vary laterally, it really doesn't matter where in this volume the reflecting point and the, uh, and the source are located. What counts is the offset. And you can think of it as a half offset if you want. It's the offset between the source and the surface, the, let's call it the epicenter of the reflecting point. Okay, And that's what's uh, what's on the horizontal axis of this travel time matrix here, which you can't see very well, uh, but there's light gray over here and darker gray and black towards the edges. And in blue, I've uh, made these travel time contours. Okay, And this is using Vidali's code, which is another topic. You know, Deterministic travel times are another thing I can, I can lecture about. Um, although, uh, this I probably calculated using uh, simple ray methods, okay, because that are amenable to uh, velocity increases with depth. Okay, so at the upper left corner here, that's where our both our sources and receivers are, all right, at the surface zero z, and I was migrating down to ten kilometers, so my z axis went down to ten kilometers depth. And then what's this horizontal axis? I called it delta x. Okay, and notice it's that bold x again. All right, whatever direction, you know, the the uh, in three dimensions and and this cocorp um, uh, line that was uh, done by an NSF funded project out of Cornell University, this cocorp reflection line um, followed a a very uh, um, a very wiggly path uh, along mountain roads through the town of Parkfield, California, which is famed for its uh, road bridge that's being torn apart by uh, creep on the San Andreas Fault. So the um, the delta x is really the the location of the of the uh, the the horizontal location vector of the 
reflecting point minus the, <coughs> the s location, the source location vector. Okay? And, and the, value, the absolute value of that, the magnitude of that, is just a, an offset number, right? <clears throat> so here we're taking offsets from 0 to 15 kilometers. Okay? And uh, so here, you know, as long as our, our reflecting point is at less than 10 kilometers depth and less than 15 kilometers offset, any direction of offset, okay, uh, we can get the travel time from the surface point be it source or receiver, to a reflecting point somewhere down in here. Just by look, you know, this is a lookup table. Okay, we've determined the travel time to every point in this section, and we just look it up. So we use it once from for the time from the source to the reflector, and again for the time from the reflector to the receiver with reciprocity. And if you look at these contours, you can see that these are. Um, Oh, again, I said hyperboloids. Sorry, those are those are ellipsoids. They're distorted ellipsoids, distorted by the increase in velocity with depth. Hey, John, I don't really understand how you would use this to go from reflector to receiver. Right. <coughs> so you know. You also put the source at the receiver. Is that what you put this? You put the 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 travel time generator source at the receive at the receiver location. So you would need two. You need two of the you, well, but you you just use the same one, okay? So uh, like down at Z, if we had this, say the reflector was on that contour and the source was up on the same contour at the top, there would be no difference. So how no, no. Um, um, how does that work? So uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to draw on the board. Um, So here's uh, our easting axis. There's our our northing axis and depth, and we've got a we've got a source on the surface. We've got a um, a receiver, okay, and there's a depth point um, somewhere somewhere down here, and uh, and that depth point has an epicenter. Which is uh, which is right there, okay, straight above the depth point. So this is our uh, our uh, uh, x y z, and so this is the point uh, x y, okay, and there's our our source vector and our uh, our g vector, okay. So uh, projecting the uh, the point, uh, the time from the source to the uh, to the reflection point. Okay, I draw that that plane, that vertical plane, through the source, the epicenter of the reflecting point, and the um, um, and the uh, the actual reflecting point at depth. And I get a, a delta x. Let's call that delta x sub s. Okay. Now, regarding the receiver as a source, okay, I, I pass the uh, uh, the plane through the epicenter and the the receiver as a source. Okay, which is a completely different location in three D, and I get another offset delta x. G call it. Okay. So um, you know, let's let's go back to the uh, the travel time volume now, and um, let's see. So are we assuming no lateral variations at this point. Uh, we're not assuming anything about. Well, yes, we're assuming no. Yeah, to use this travel time matrix, we're assuming no lateral variations. Okay, that's what I was. Okay. Saying. So, um, let's see, I'll uh, save that uh, diagram.
here. Okay. Maybe I can insert that into the video at some point. Um, all right, so uh, the uh, the reflecting point, let's say it's at five kilometers depth. Okay, we're we're here in the in in this, and let's say that the delta x s is uh, five kilometers. So I would go in this travel time matrix, okay, which is good for uh, uh, pre-stack time migration, okay. And it's for velocity that varies with depth, but not laterally. All right, I go over to five kilometers offset. Right, the top scale here is offset delta x, five kilometers offset and five kilometers depth, and I pick up that travel time there, which is going to be about two point eight seconds. Okay, then I, I move to the receiver location. All right, and let's say it's uh, it's delta x g is um, is 10 kilometers. It's still at five, the reflecting point is still at five kilometers depth. So then I go over here to 10 kilometers offset and still five kilometers depth and I pick up that uh, time. Okay, so that's for, you know, this is this time has been projected from the receiver location down to the reflecting point, but that's by reciprocity, that's the same time that you would have from the reflecting point to the um, to the to the receiver, okay, and that time is one, two, three, four, four point five seconds. So four point five plus two point eight, okay, that's um, uh, uh, five uh, seven point uh, three, I think, seconds, and uh, so that will be the uh, that will be the travel time. That I look for uh, to summon the amplitude into that reflecting point. A quick question. So, this method of using these ellipsoids in the superposition assumes that you can have impedance contrast anywhere along the ellipsoid, right? For any little impulse, right? On your finger. That's correct. But then this travel time just assumes that you're only looking at like a flat reflector, right? No, no. The, the, this notice um, uh, notice that the um, uh, these the notice that these travel time contours because we're getting into a head wave here because of the increase you could imagine a ray coming down perpendicular to the contours hitting the underside of a reflector and you could call that you could say that's at more than ninety degrees dip if you like. Okay, hitting the underside of a reflector and then bouncing back. Okay, now what this what this is also saying is that we are, and, and this is how we're going to get to the uh, dynamic part of this. We are adding in all amplitudes equally. Okay, the 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 incident angle is not necessarily equal to the angle of reflection. Okay. That's only the those angles are only where you get the minimum travel time, but we're considering all incidence angles and all reflection angles, and they don't have to be equal. And then we're just adding up all those amplitudes, as if as if the uh, reflection coefficient were the same. Okay, I guess one thing that was kind of confusing was if you had something that was bouncing off the ellipsoid over here. The time from the source to the reflector point would be different than the time, like if you had this the two points right here, right? Yeah. And you had something that hit over here, and then bounced over here to the receiver. The the time from the source to the reflector point would be much different than the time from the reflector point to the geophone. Absolutely right. So once you need two of those plots, kind of like what Kyle was saying. Yeah, yeah. I'm using the same plot twice, assuming velocity doesn't change with with x with location, okay. it only changes with depth. I have to use this. I have to use two travel times, right? So the offset would just be different in that case. You That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Yeah, you can see that's um, 
you know, for parts of this ellipsoid, right? I mean, it's very. Uh, um, uh, you get all these combi all different combinations of um, all different combinations of angles, incidence angles, reflecting angles, everything. Yeah, yeah, I see. So you just you switch your reference frame when you when you switch your source receiver locations. Yeah, yeah. You're actually moving this travel time matrix around. You know, the travel time matrix is. Uh, uh, is covering that area there, that plane, actually it should be like that, and it's uh, it's covering, you know, that area um, <laughs> when I'm going from the receiver in that view. So yeah, we're just moving this travel time matrix around. Okay. But we all, that's all, we, you know, that one travel time matrix is all we need, and we can handle any any velocity variation with depth, and we can't handle any lateral velocity variation. Okay. Uh, again, uh, these are uh, ellipsoids. All right. So the um, you know we don't need that much storage. We don't need uh, um, we just need that one travel time matrix, which is going to be about the same size as the section that we're projecting into. Okay, uh, and uh, you might need, um, you know, uh, millions or billions of travel times um, if uh, if you have uh, velocity that varies in in x and y as well as z. Um, these days, uh, that's not that difficult. I mean, how many travel time values do you think you generated, you know, in MATLAB for your uh, um, for your latest model runs, Kyle? You know, know, millions, billions. You can calculate it. Like. Could <laughs> if you like, just to just to impress the uh, you know the further generations here. So here's the situation that um, that I had with this cocorp survey across the San Andreas Fault. We have a near vertical fault that has you know some sort of not you know slightly non vertical geometry. So here I'm representing it with this uh, sort of S-shaped curve. And you have a source that's standing off from the fault. And then velocity increases with depth. So you know, very naturally, the rays bend around, and they start to refract. And they become pretty horizontal. And then they hit the fault, you know, a sidewall reflection from the fault. And then they bounce back to a receiver. Okay. So this uh, sidewall fault reflection, right? That's all in three dimensions. We've got uh, we've got a wiggly line, um, and we can cast our section wherever we want, uh, or we could do the whole three D if we if we decided to. In this early paper, I I didn't uh, do three D. I just located some sections in three dimensions. Okay. So uh, with this uh, with this configuration. We got data that uh, had um, um, in in three D uh, it had negative move out even in the common midpoint gather. Okay, and this was the really uh, the real surprise. Okay, if in a common midpoint gather you have negative move out, you're you know you're completely stopped with the separable uh, imaging process. You can't do anything. Um, because there's no way that uh, applying the NMO operator to this to this negative move out is going to result in anything valid. It just wipes it out. Okay. Now on the on the so so approaching the San Andreas, <clears throat> an offset increases to the left here <clears throat> from this midpoint. Okay. This uh, this negative move out um, uh, appeared. And on the other side of the San Andreas, as the survey you know passed the San Andreas, it became a uh, um, a positive, a normal move out, and this you you could handle, okay. Um, and I think uh, I think now DMO would not work because you um, you need to do an approximate uh, NMO correction to begin the DMO process. 
And so that's just going to rip this to shreds. Uh, it would work on this one. Okay. So we take one trace, okay, possibly including this, this uh, back dipping reflection, this uh, sidewall reflection here. And, uh, and we, uh, we project it through a cross section. And the cross section here is, um, and this is a synthetic trace, the cross section is 10 kilometers wide and 5 kilometers deep. And here is that distorted ellipsoid. It's a section of, of that ellipsoid of revolution. So here's the result that I got near the San Andreas. And uh, as crummy as these look, uh, they look better than the, uh, the original product by uh, uh, McBride. Um, and so uh, he wrote a, uh, a letter of protest uh, to, uh, to Geophysics, the journal where I published this. And, uh, and then I, I made a reply where um, we... Uh, uh, and, and for the reply, I generated the synthetics. Um, and that was the reason this got, uh, you know, this honorable mention as one of the, uh, one of the, the five uh, or nine best papers in geophysics that year. Because it had generated, um, it had generated uh, uh, correspondence. And um, both McBride and I got an additional publication on our, um, on our CVs as the letters. You know, the letters were also uh, peer-reviewed peer and, uh, and reviewed by the editors, so they count as full publications. Um, and they were published in the journal. So uh, uh, scientific controversy is a great thing, especially for your resume. Uh, never shy away from it. Um, and, and, you know, this controversial paper um, remains... Uh, um, uh, it remains, uh, uh, you know, my uh, um, one of my uh, uh, better cited and uh, and uh, you know best regarded papers. So again, no reason to shrink from from controversy. Okay, so yeah, backing out a little bit helps uh, see these, um, and here's kind of a half map. And you can see the, uh, the San Andreas Fault. There's a north arrow for you. And then we're, we have a section in the area of the, uh, um, maybe I should come back in a bit. All right, we have a, um, a section. Uh, um, uh, here, a cutaway view of the San Andreas down to five kilometers depth. At two to two and a half kilometers, this uh, Cetozoic sedimentary section has its uh, transition to uh, the granitic uh, Slinian block rocks of uh, Monterey County, California. And uh, you can see the, the wiggly path of the survey through here. Okay, so section A is all in the uh, Slinian block. You know, approaching the San Andreas. Okay, go up to section A, and we can't see much. We can see plenty of these ellipsoidal artifacts. Okay, and there's uh, there's the bottom of the sedimentary section, approaching the San Andreas Fault. Weird, uh, you know, I mean maybe it's an artifact, but very steeply dipping uh, reflector here. Okay, let's look back down at the map. Okay. Section A overlaps with uh, Section B. All right. You know, I can take these sections anywhere I want in three dimensions. So what do we see in Section B? Well, here you can kind of see uh, uh, in the overlap, you can kind of see what, what comes of that. I mean, lots of, uh, lots of artifacts, but a near vertical reflector there. OK. Anyway, amplitude building up in the section near vertical. All right. And that's the uh, that reflector is associated with the uh, the the um, intermediate rocks that are within the uh, the San Andreas fault zone. Okay, so the San Andreas you know has taken different paths through this area at different times, 
and so the fault zone is uh, about uh, five kilometers wide, and um, and so these Cenozoic sediments are truncated against a vertical wall of of where a, some ancient strand of the San Andreas has offset them against intermediate rocks. Okay, so there's a 90 degree dipping reflector there. All right. Some hints here of a 45 degree dipping reflector. These are all one to one sections, five kilometers by five kilometers. This uh, section um, D, um, this section D here is just southwest, southeast of B. So it runs parallel to B and it's uh, southwest. So these, uh, these two are only a couple kilometers uh, apart from each other. And they, they show very similar things. Here's a 45-degree uh, dipping reflector. The surface traces of the modern San Andreas that broke in 1966 is right there on the ground. Uh, this is the, where the town of Parkfield is. This is where there's a Gold Hill uh, thrust fault, which uh, has inclusions of, um, of uh, ultramafic rocks along it. And here's the, the ill-known trace of a fault to the southwest. Again, here's that, that, um, uh, that vert near vertical reflector. Okay. And there's some flat boundary. Okay. Some flat boundary underneath the San Andreas. And then here in, um, in section C, notice that section C has a very different azimuth. Okay, we see that dipping reflector in, in apparent dip. So it doesn't dip as sharply because it's an apparent dip. Okay, coming up underneath that uh, Gold Hill Fault. So this is the interpretation. You've got this 45 degree dipping ultramafic lens uh, providing a sharp reflector. Uh, we've got the sharp reflector, strong reflection uh, provided by the uh, San Andreas fault zone offsetting uh, Cenozoic sediments against uh, intermediate uh, uh, plutonic rocks along this vertical boundary. And then we have the, uh, uh, the sedimentary, uh, the bottom of the sedimentary sequence also providing a sharp reflector. And there's this near horizontal thing underneath the, uh, the San Andreas fault and probably uh, bounded by the modern trace, right? That horizontal reflector ends right under the modern trace. Okay, and um, you know what that thing is is anybody's guess. Um, they haven't uh, in all the drilling they've done uh, in the uh, in the San Andreas Fault uh, under the uh, uh, under the EarthScope project. They still haven't drilled through that thing. Um, they found these other uh, these other things. So this is actually, uh, you know, in recent years, uh, this has been somewhat confirmed by drilling, which, for me, for a, a deep crustal tectonic study, is uh, pretty unusual. Okay. So. Um, you know, we're calculating the, uh, we're basically projecting. This is a, another term that we'll assign to this is back projection. That's the, the method that we're using for, um, um, for downward continuation. It's just back projection. We're projecting, you know, trace amplitudes into, uh, uh, into the section here. Um, and we're using the Ray equation. And we're assuming all the data are only primary acoustic reflections of infinitely high frequency, and they're in the far field. Uh, and when we consider an extension to Kirchhoff migration, which, which I'll call reflection tomography, and we'll see uh, where those assumptions come from. OK? So uh, tomorrow I'll show you uh, another example of uh, PSTM uh, using uh, Kirchhoff, but using earthquakes as sources instead of using uh, um, instead of using a, an exploration seismic line.